This podcast is brought to you by Cash App. When personal finance connects you to both your funds and the stuff that matters, that's money, and that's Cash App. You know what else is money? Choosing your own cash tag. That's money. Picking the cash tag, world sickest sicko. Using it to request the $50 your squirrely cousin owes you. That's money. Actually finally getting that $50. Your table agreeing French toast is for sharing. That's money. Splitting the karaoke room bill while still holding the high note on strawberry wine. That's money. Digging a hole with friends. That's money. Hearing a wildly good musician in the train home and tipping their cash tag. That's money. Watching a fine pastry float down a river. That's money. Getting paid to read a wonderful ad script from our good friends at Cash App. That's money. Sending everyone in the group chat a good night dollar. That's money. Waking up to all those good morning dollars. That's money. Beating JJ in a bet. That's money. (laughs) Sending, spending, saving, investing, splitting, tipping, donating, gifting, or just typing numbers, all with the number one finance app in the App Store. That's money. That's money. That's Cash App. Download Cash App from the App Store or Google Play Store today to add your cash tag to the 80 million and counting. Welcome to the Old Man of the Three with JJ Reddick and Tommy Alter, presented by Cash App and brought to you by 342 Productions. This is episode 131, Ty Lu, the return of our coaching series. I don't think there's a better guest right now in basketball to kick this off with than Ty Lu, Tommy. Yes, one of the best coaches in all sports, really. And he's got such an affable personality. He doesn't do a lot of press, he prefers not to. Um, I had to personally beg him to come on the show. We, we get into that a little bit. Uh, but look, Ty Lu started essentially as a player development coach with the Boston Celtics under Doc Rivers. He then went to the Clippers originally to be an assistant where I played for him. Um, then he went to the Cavs to be an assistant. He took over for David Blatt, won a championship there, went back to the Clippers as an assistant for Doc Rivers, and then eventually took over the Clippers, has done an outstanding job there. Obviously, he's... Uh, that team and, and him and his coaching uh, career has been befallen a little bit with injuries to the Clippers, but they look like they're in a prime position to be a title contender. The other funny thing is, Tommy, a lot of people just don't know this, but I did play with Ty Lue for about two months. <laughs> the, we, get, we get into that as well. <laughs> it's interesting. He's just a guy. He's a coach that is, has seen it all you know, in a pretty short amount of time, which is unique. He's been thrown into some crazy situations, which we talk about. Um, but it doesn't get having your first head coaching job being that spot is, doesn't get much more wild than that when you really think about it. Yeah. And, and we also discuss a little bit about his playing career. And of course we talk uh, towards the end of the conversation about the infamous Allen Iverson step over in the NBA finals, uh, way back when uh, it's sort of become an iconic moment in NBA history and, and he's on sort of the bad side of it, but he, I think he has a great perspective on it. I'm always struck, you know, Ty, I don't want to knock Ty. I don't want to knock Ty, but I'm going to knock him. You know, he he was a solid NBA player. Uh, there was nothing really spectacular about his, his career. Um, but he's got so much confidence. Um, I think that's what made him an NBA player. It's what makes him a great coach. Uh, you know, I remember being his teammate. I remember being around him as a player when he was my coach. He's got confidence. He's got swagger. Uh, he's got a great way of dealing with people and talking to people, and we get into all of this, all of that in this conversation. All right, Tommy, we're a week into this NBA season. There's so much going on around the league. There's so much that we could highlight, but I thought maybe each of us could highlight uh, three players or, or a team and two players, whatever it may be. I, th- I think each of us could highlight three things, three things that we saw from the first week. And, and again, this is way too early reactions, but I'm curious to hear what stood out for, for, for you from the first week of the NBA season. Well, besides breaking up the Utah Jazz, <laughs> um, the three guys I wanted to highlight were were Dame, uh, Jason Tatum, and Ben Mather and in, in Indy. I think the Dame... Uh, the Dame stuff sort of speaks for itself. I mean, 41 points in back-to-back nights. We're taping this on Monday. Um, My question for you about Dame in general is, I guess not really Dame in general, the Blazer in general, is do you think that, you know, we did our previews last week, do you think that people have slept on this team a little bit? Um, I don't know what the assumption that he wasn't going to be the same player or anything like that, but this was a team that, you know, made the conference finals three years ago. They added Jeremy Grant, who's an Olympic (laughs) player. I mean, is is one of the... Uh, better wings in the league. Is this a team that right now we're taping this or three and O is this a team that you think, uh, you know, we're not making 
playoff predictions today, but you think that people have kind of forgotten about a bit and have, have come out uh, with a little bit of a fire. Well, right. I think people have forgotten about them and rightfully so. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, they, they haven't been great uh, over the last couple of seasons. Some of that is because of uh, bad injury luck. luck. Obviously, Dame being hurt. Uh, Nurchik, Nurkic has been in and out of the lineup. Uh, look, I, I still think given the depth of the Western Conference, and we don't know going forward, I, I'm praying and hoping that uh, there's no major injuries in the NBA this season. We don't know how injuries are going to affect each conference's playoff race, but I, I still think it's too early to say uh, this is a playoff team because you and I last week, we talked about our playoff predictions, and I believe both of us had the Blazers sort okay. of in that 9-10 yeah. play-in spot, and there's nothing that I've seen from any of the other teams that we had ahead of them that would suggest that they have somehow leapfrogged them three games into the season. I, I do think to your to your you know original sort of observation about Dame, for me, I, I think it's more about Dame sort of being slept on, right? D, you know, we forget the first team All NBA Dame that we saw for a number of seasons. He is so good at basketball, and when a player gets injured for an extended period of time, when a, a team loses their relevancy, that player ends up staying. You know, D Dame has always been so committed to the Portland uh, Bla Trailblazers franchise. We we tend to just kind of put them on the back burner, and Dame is as good as any lead guard in the NBA. I mean, I, I'm not saying he's better than Steph. You know, I'm not saying any of that. I'm just saying he's in that category of – a, a, an all NBA player when he's healthy and on the court. And we, we saw that over the last two games. He did struggle a little bit in game one, but he's averaging, you know, 34 game, five rebounds, four assists. The team's three and oh. Um, I, I don't know if, you know, if you're the Blazers, like that's as good of a start that you could hope for for your team and for a guy that's coming off uh, a, a, a long injury that, that he just had to rehab. We should, before we get to Tatum, we should shout out uh, Josh Hart. As well, I mean, this is like who who knows with this team, but they have a lot of they have a they have a lot of winning players. They're they're they're, they're they are they're sneakily solid. It's the thing we always go back to, Tommy, which is you need talent, you need stars, and you need role players around them that star in their role. And Josh Hart is a guy that has gotten better. Uh, I think he. He got better last year. He got to play with the with the basketball in his hands more when he was in New Orleans. He continued that trend when he got traded to the Blazers, and and, and he's continued it already this season. Uh, Jeremy Grant's another guy that plays hard. Uh, look, I like this team. I, I just we're going to talk about this throughout the season. You know, unless there's a, ma a major injury or a couple major injuries, both of these conferences have so much depth, one through ten. Yeah. Um. Our boy Tatum, by the way. Yeah, that's what we should. Because we should. I wanted to talk. You brought him up. Look, I, you know, after week one, he's leading the NBA in scoring. He's 58% from the field. Uh, the turnovers are down, which is something he struggled with. And he, you know, he went against a couple really good defenses, maybe not the Orlando Magic, but you know, he, he's doing this against good defenses. I thought what stood out most for me, there were two things that really stood out most for me on Jason Tatum in the first week of the season. First game of the season on Tuesday night against the Sixers, he had a stretch in the second half where he essentially went on a 10-2 run by himself, and it was dominance on both ends. And that's what we saw last year, this leap that he took defensively. He led the Celtics, the best defense in the league. He led the Celtics in defensive win shares both in the regular season and the playoffs. And that little run in the second half against the 76ers was such an encapsulation of his dominance on both ends of the floor. I saw the stat muse. I don't know. Do you see the stat muse post about Giannis? It's no. like, if we can all agree that Giannis is the most dominant two-way player, which I, I I don't know that there's a disagreement there for me. Yeah. Like how much behind is Tatum right now? I, it, it, not I, much. Not much. Not he's much. probably be, he's behind, but it's yeah. it's not much. I mean, he cemented himself as a as a top two way talent. Uh, I I mean, I'll throw Embiid in there when I, I think when Joel is engaged, um, I, I think he's so dominant defensively. The problem for him sometimes is when he's left out in space against quicker guards uh, in that drop coverage. I, I think sometimes. You know he struggles with that, but when he's engaged, I think he's another guy that's a top two-way talent. Do you think they're they are 
playing him more? Are they playing him differently defensively at all? Is he playing a little more in that free safety Williams role, or is this does it look pretty similar to last year in terms of? I mean, they're obviously switching all the time, but how he's being positioned defensively. No, I don't. I, don't, I, I mean, I didn't see anything. I, I, I didn't watch all three. I watched two of their games, but you know, I watched the Miami game and I and I watched the uh, the Seventy Sixers game. Um, forgive me for not watching the Orlando Magic play. Um, Magic are fun to watch. We're, I, we're, we're I, gonna be, I won't be watching the Magic. I'm sure. Year. I'm we're sure gonna, I'll I'll tune into some Magic two month, games. Two months in. Um, no, but I I I haven't seen anything particularly different. Uh, you know, this is a, a, a switch heavy team. Um, I think I, I was explaining this to my eight year old on the walk to school today uh, when he was asking of what position does Marcus Smart play, and I was explaining to him. You know, the NBA now is like a primary ball handler, wings, and a rim protecting big slash a rolling big. And there's obviously exceptions to this. There's, you know, Jokic and, and Embiid. Uh, there's Zion as a as a true really power forward. He's not a wing. He's not a center. So there's exceptions to that. But generally speaking, you know, that's sort of the modern NBA. And the Boston Celtics have two of the best wings in the NBA. And then they have Marcus Smart who guards a bunch of positions. They have Al Horford who can switch. They have Robert Williams eventually get back in the lineup. Malcolm Brogdon's no slouch on defense in terms of his switchability. Grant Williams, of course. So this team, like we talked about all through last year during the playoffs, this team is so sound on that end. Uh, I, I loved what they did against Joel Embiid in that first game. You know, they varied when the doubles came. Sometimes it was on the catch, depending on the matchup. Uh, sometimes it was on the dribble. Sometimes it was a dig. Uh, and they they created a bunch of turnovers that way. And, and to me, that speaks not only to their personnel, but to the intelligence of their personnel, the intelligence of the game plan. And that, to me, is the mark of not only a great defensive team, but a great team. Yeah. Um, you're, you're, you know, I, I really thought if we were going to talk Pacers here, we were going to talk Tyrese Halliburton. Well, so I don't want to <laughs> talk about Tyrese because I don't think this is surprising. I think Tyrese yeah. is is going to be an all-star this year. Obviously, we're biased, but, you know, he's looked great in his first three games, and I think he's going to continue to look great. I think we should shout out Ben because you just never know with rookies. You you know, I thought, I thought. I mean, I'm curious what you just think about his game overall. He, uh, I saw a stat. He has the most points in the first three games of any rookie since 1995, 72. I thought the the pull-up game was, <laughs> was crazy. The confidence of a guy coming in his first three games, and he's just... And he is just jacking them in a good way. You know, he's, he, he knows that he belongs. Well, I, I, I actually, this is sort of a general observation about all the talent coming in the league right now. There's a level of confidence that young players have. And I don't remember 15, 20, yes, there's certainly exceptions to this. But, you know, by and large, like these guys are super confident. They're super skilled. Uh, through three games, he's 11 for 21 from three. Another stat, most points scored off the bench in the first three games since starting lineups were tracked in 1970. This is, I mean, this is a historic three-game start for a rookie. Uh, Paolo Boncaro, of course, he's another one who's gotten off to a great start for a rookie. Uh, first player, I think since uh, LeBron, maybe? I, some Well, the most... most um, most points in a debut since LeBron, but I think yeah. he's the first rookie in however many years to score 25 or more in his first three games. Murray, Murray's look really good too. Yeah, in, look, in, I, in a small sample. Yeah, size. right. He's only played a couple games, but I just, you know, I, I'm a, I'm I'm in love with the young talent in the NBA. Uh, there's just so much of it. Speaking of young talent, uh, one of the guys that stood out for me was John Morant, and obviously we can talk about his dunks and his finishing ability his little left hand dribble when he's going left and he doesn't pick the ball up with his right hand and he uses his body to shield a bigger defender and he scoops it in going left like that's just next level we could talk about all that the blocks everything what's impressed me has been his shooting um you know he's 57 percent from three he was 0 for two in his last game but he's 57 percent from three through three games i i went on a little bit of a deep dive on youtube I looked at a bunch of three-pointers that he made last year. I looked at some three-pointers that he's made this year. It appears to me, and I would love to get him on the podcast so we can confirm or deny this, but it appears to me that his shot pocket is slightly higher, uh, and he's jumping a little bit more because he, he it was more of a flat-footed shot that he shot from three. He's jumping a little bit more on his three-pointer 
and the form to me looks different. Maybe maybe I'm seeing things, but the form looks different. I also saw in the Houston game, you know, Ja faces a lot of drop coverage. I saw in the Houston game, you know, he's getting to his drop co- you know, drop coverage package where he's shooting his floaters. He's scooting by the big, scoring at the rim and everything. There was a moment in the second half where he came off, the big was in a big drop, and he pulled up from 17 feet and he jumped. Like he shot a legitimate jumper. And that mid-range pull-up, it's something that a lot of guys have talked about. RJ Barrett talked about it on the podcast when he came on at the end of the regular season last year. That to me is such an important shot when you get to the playoffs. And so many guys like Devin Booker, uh, DeMar DeRozan, Chris Middleton, so many guys that can operate and pick and roll in the playoffs have added or have always had that pull-up mid-range jumper. And that to me is something to watch for John Morant. I want to get to the team that just smacked John <laughs> Morant at Memphis. And you want to, I know you want to talk about Christian Wood, but we should, I feel like we should just talk about the, the Mavs in general. Yeah, look, I, I think of anything, of any team that we talked about last week on the show when we gave our playoff seating predictions. <laughs> and again, playoffs are all about matchups. We talk about that all the time. The, the most sort of pushback that I saw in the comments section was from Mavs fans yeah. or people that just with observations Under, about the Mavs. Understandable, yeah. by the way. They eight, just made the put, conference finals. Yeah, I get it. the eight seed in the conference is tough. Um, but, but, you know, I think the luxury of having both JaVale McGee and Christian Wood in that big position, it provides you with a lot of flexibility in terms of uh, lineup changes, uh, play styles, JaVel McGee is going to protect the rim. He's going to roll. He's going to screen. Christian Wood is going to score. He's going to pop. He's going to create in space. Uh, through two games, he's averaging 25 and 10 and averaging, you know, and 50% from the three. So this this big combo that they have, um, you know, I, it, it's great. And I actually thought to myself this morning, <laughs> I thought, are we going to have another Chicago Bulls situation from last year? <laughs> We're, we're this no, team. No, because we're both we're both wrong. So I will, no, we may you, we may have you it. thought the Bulls. Were, I you thought the Bulls were going to be good. I was like, hey, I don't think it's going to move the needle. And and you know, despite the injuries, um, they ended up with a you know with a, with a good seed. Uh, you know, I think they ended up with a six seed last year. Um, I, my question, my question about you know the Mavs in general, and Jason has been harping this to us the last. Jason two weeks. Gallagher is right. Yeah, biggest Mavs He's fan. Blah, Mavs blah, blah, Homer, blah. but he has been harping to this is. is is have we ever really seen Luca play with a big like Wood? You think about it because KP KP was just a different player. He just they, they they had a completely different skill set, and Dwight Powell looked great at points. Um, but I don't necessarily think he's the same. He's the same talent as somebody like Wood. Uh, and so when you look at like somebody like Luca and how Luca plays, what could this possibly unlock for him for a guy who's already basically unguardable ninety five percent of the time? <laughs> Well, I don't want to. I'm not going to disparage KP's skill set because I think his skill set is great. I, I don't know that uh, you know the fit at times was seemed a little off. You know, from from when I was there, and and I think K- KP also, you know, in terms of his reputation, got hurt a lot from that Clippers series um, when by design, by design, uh, Rick Carlisle said, "Go park yourself in the corner. You're not going to be involved in action." So I, I I do think there's some similarities between the two in terms of being a popping big, being able to stretch the floor. Um, I, look, I like I like at times Christian Wood's role game. I like his I like his game off the dribble. I, I mentioned earlier uh, potentially a little better just in terms of creating in space. Whereas I feel like at times KP on that throwback was strictly a closeout guy. Like he could, if you ran him off the line, then he could get some somewhere. Christian Wood has a little more variability to his game off the bounce. Um, and look, we'll see if this this three-point shooting holds up. He's certainly going to get a lot, open, lot of open looks. As we noted last year, in terms of open threes created by a player, uh, Luka is at the top or near the top uh, every year in terms of creating open threes for his teammates. Uh, the last thing I want to talk about, last thing I want to talk about real quick, is the worst take ever in sports history. <laughs> which apparently I had last week. I'll vehemently disagree with that. It's not going to be the last time this happens, by the way. So, you know, one of the one of the problems with aggregate media is uh, a quote. Everybody uses out of context. 
a quote out of context that um, people read as a headline. And, and in this case, it was uh, our old friends at Clutch Points, which is the worst website, uh, aggregate sports media. I don't know what to call them. I don't. Are they a site? They're not, certainly not creators, but the worst sports media aggregate people in the world. And so they took this clip I had from First Take. So Will Bond, Stephen A, and I, we started the show off talking about expectations for the Lakers. And if you watched, if you actually took the time to watch the uh, 12 to 13 minutes that we talked about the Lakers, it was actually a very nuanced, intelligent discussion that we gave. Uh, you know, we talked about why this roster is not good. Obviously, it's the, it's the shooting and the spacing. Um, not a lot of high-level big wing defenders. Um, not a lot of depth. Uh, we talked about the fact that when Anthony Davis, Russell Westbrook, and LeBron James are all in the lineup together, uh, you know, small sample size as of last week, eleven and eleven. It's it's worse now. They're they're under five hundred uh, since this this team was formed. Um, talked about for five minutes about whether or not the trade for Miles Turner and Buddy Heald would actually move the needle for the Lakers. So we had this great conversation about it. Um, and we provided a bunch of data points and a bunch of analysis and, and it was a really thoughtful, I thought 12 to 13 minutes. Um, and as sort of a, not a dig on the producers at ESPN, uh, but look, we spent all of last year talking about what, what ills the Lakers, what, what, why are the Lakers so bad? It's the same fucking reason. Yeah. It's the same fucking reason this year. And I don't want to spend the entire season talking about it. So I noted, I noted if you're a Lakers fan. If you're a producer of this show, by the way, let's not spend the entire season talking about the same fucking thing over and over. Here's an idea. Here's some silver lining for you Lakers fans out there. LeBron's going to be in a Lakers uniform when he breaks Kareem's record. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And all of a sudden that turned into the worst take in sports history. How lazy are you? How late? You want some analysis? Here's some analysis. Through the Lakers' start of the season, they're 25 for 118 on three-pointers. That's the worst three-point field goal percentage through a team's first three games of a season in NBA history. The shot that Russell Westbrook took, under 30 seconds, over 15 seconds on the shot clock, up one. No player has done that, that two-for-one, since Eric Gordon in 2019. And Eric Gordon was trying to draw a foul. We can talk all day about holding LeBron James accountable. The Lakers don't have shooting. It's a poor fit for Russell Westbrook. I don't know how many times we can say that. You feel better? I feel a lot better. <laughs> I do I do think that you're, we've talked about this a million times in the show, but it's just a frustration with media in general is we spend all this time talking about this the insane depth of both conferences, but in this particular case, the Western Conference, and how many great young players there are, how many how many fun teams there are to watch. Why the fuck do we have to spend all this time talking about the ten seed? If that they may not even be the ten seed, but I'm saying is like they are not they're not in the conversation right now with the other teams that we've been talking about. And so this is I mean I'm just backing you up on this, but what's the point of harping on it for an hour? Well, because it's LeBron James, because it's the Lakers, because. Anthony Davis and Russell Westbrook um, are highly scrutinized players. Um, you know, they're they're two guys. I mean, of course, LeBron is too. Uh, you know, they're, you're talking about three guys that NBA Twitter loves to talk about. Um, but in terms of analysis, I just think it's pretty simple. By the way, Tommy, according to our friends at DraftKings Sportsbook, the Lakers right now have plus 3,500 odds to win the NBA championship. Uh, by the way, so overall, as of right now, that's fourth most money bet on a team to win the championship is the Lakers. And uh, I think we can all agree that this version of the Lakers uh, doesn't have a, a, a great odds of winning that championship. People, people have spent their money on a lot of dumb <laughs> shit over the last couple of years, uh, and this is up there. Right now, the Celtics and the Warriors have the best odds to win the NBA championship, according to DraftKings. Is there anything you've seen over the first week of the season that would deter you from believing that? No. Makes total sense. I, I agree with you. I agree with you. It, what about a, sp a sleeper pick for you? Is, is there a team 
you know, not necessarily based on odds, but there's a team that for you that's like, I, I could see them winning their conference and getting to the finals and having a chance. Well, I'm throwing one out there now, which we talked about a bit last week. Um, like somebody like Milwaukee isn't a sleeper. I don't even think Philly is much of a sleeper at this point, even with their start. I'm very curious about the Pelicans. Talent-wise, they're plus 3,000 right now. Um, and I think that that is a, a young, deep team that's going to keep getting better. By the way, they also own the Lakers picks for the next 20, 25 years. What do you think uh what do you think about them, you know, a week in as a as a team that could potentially are they built for the playoffs? Yeah, I look, I I think you could make an argument that they are built for the playoffs. We saw them play a really good Phoenix Suns team uh, neck and neck last year, uh, got it to six games. I, they have size. That, that was a big takeaway from last week. Uh, they have a lot of size. Uh, the size on the wing, Brandon Ingram, Trey Murphy, Herb Jones, uh, the size inside with Valanchunas and Zion, CJ McCollum. They have shooting. Uh, I like their team a lot. Uh, another team I, I I like, uh, you know, I want to see them more, and I have their game uh, this week uh, against the Lakers, and that's the Denver Nuggets. Your guy, KCP, who you shouted out in the newsletter, got off to uh, a really nice start. He hit six threes the other night. That's another team. But as of right now, it, when we talk about the Western Conference, it's the Clippers and the Warriors that have the the, the best odds of of winning the Western Conference. Can I, can I throw out one more right before we go? Cavs, plus 1,300. Throw it out. Cavs? Why not? Cavs? <laughs> right now, everyone can earn up to a hundred percent boost with DraftKings stepped up same game parlays. Go to the DraftKings Sportsbook app, opt in, and place a stepped up same game parlay today. If you don't already have an account, download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now and sign up with promo code JJ and boost your winnings up to one hundred percent. That's code JJ only at DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. Minimum age and eligibility restrictions apply. See show notes for details. All right, before we get to our conversation with T. Lou and the return of our coaching series. Uh, just a quick reminder, we have a newsletter, A Farewell to Takes. You can sign up for it through our social channel channels. There's a link to subscribe. Go subscribe, share it, tell your friends. You can also go to 342.com, spelled out 342.com. You can sign up for the newsletter there. A lot of interesting stuff. Tommy, we had some uh, great stuff from this week. Uh, we're doing Wine of the Week, Best Thing Tommy Ate, Gallagher TV Plus, uh, and of course, a bunch of great content around the NBA, our thoughts, not takes. Here's our conversation with Ty Lu. All right, let's welcome in Ty Lu. Ty, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, we've been asking you for a year. I had oh. to give multiple, oh. <laughs> multiple shout outs about you turning down the podcast on, ES down? on ESPN for you to come on the show. I had to put a little <laughs> pressure on you. So I appreciate it, man. No, you my guy. You know, I don't really like doing too much TV stuff, but um, you know, you my guy. So, you know, I'm glad I can, you know, be on here and I'm glad you wanted me on here, actually. So um thank you for that. Of course. Uh a little background. So Ty and I were uh teammates. I also played for Ty my first year <laughs> with the Clippers. Um, but we were teammates for like three months in Orlando. Jameer Nelson hurt his shoulder. I think two days later, we traded for you, basically. And I played two games. <laughs> <laughs> and then they brought Skip in, who did a hell of a job. So, um, But that, that was a great experience for me, though, really. And um, just, you know, like I said, just um, being with a young team, you and Courtney Lee and, um, you know, Mikhail and all. It was just it was a fun time. And it was my last year in the league. And so having a chance to be in Orlando, for one, um, and um, having a chance to go to the NBA Finals, playing with Dwight and Richard and Turkaloo, um, it was great. Even though I didn't play, it was a way to go out my last year. Um, even though we didn't win a championship. Would you Would you first think of JJ when you met him? Cocky, arrogant. Um, I thought that you know, just coming from Duke, and you know, um, and then it was another reason why later on down the road I didn't like him too much because. My mom's not really attracted to white guys, but she loves JJ. And so, so I'm like, no, nah, I can't, I can't like this guy. You know? But but no, but like once I got a chance to to meet him and you know, just be around him and just see how hard he worked. And um, you know, you get the, you know, when you come from Duke, all they get all the love and all the respect. But he actually put the work in. He was a hard worker and just seeing what he did every single day, um, it was a treat to see. My first impressions of Ty when we were teammates was that he was very slow. <laughs> I got old quick. Yeah. <laughs> got old quick. Actually, I, I, I looked it up on basketball reference. I think you actually played in eight games. In not, Orlando? Not two. I think it was eight. 
You got well, you got run. You got. Uh, well, I played in two games with some minutes, and then six of the games was like scrub minutes or quick. Somebody's in foul trouble. Ended a half, and so I didn't play a lot. But you know, after my eleventh season, I was pretty much done. Correct me if I'm wrong. I, I think this is a, this is the way my free agency with the Clippers went. But Doc gets traded essentially from the Boston Celtics. You were on the staff there. And it's like a week before free agency and you guys are trying to figure out the shooting guard position. And you are you were the one that told Doc that I was going to be a free agent. Like Doc had no idea that I was actually a free agent. Yeah. And so we were just talking about, you know, two guards and um, shooting guards that were available. And we were looking around and talking about different guys. And I was like, what do you mean? J.J. Reddick's available. He was like, Ty, I mean, you know, I said, man, no, I've seen him play. I've, I've played with him in Orlando. He works hard. The guy can shoot the basketball, a 90% free throw shooter. And defensively, like, he's not the best one-on-one defender, but he's a, he's, he's a great team defender for one. He takes charges and he knows where to be on the floor. So I said, man, it's a great pickup. And Doc, like, Ty, you sure? I'm like, I'm, <laughs> I'm sure, Doc. Like, he's a great pickup. And um, he's like, I didn't even know he's a free agent, you know, so. After all those it? years of busting Doc's ass in the Celtics, <laughs> he's he still know. got question he marks about me. No, he didn't know. Like I said, he didn't know. And not, he didn't think that you couldn't play. He just didn't know you was a free agent. And I don't even think it was on our list when we was going through it. I don't, for some reason, it wasn't on the list. And, um, but I'm glad it worked out. I'm, I'm pretty sure he is too. Wait, I, got a, I got a funny story. So I, I, I signed with the Clippers. And I, I, when I played in LA, I, I trained in Austin. Mm-hmm. And I would basically train for the entire offseason. And if we had media day on Monday, I'd show up Saturday or Sunday and then come to media day. Training camp starts the next day. So I wasn't really around the facility. And I came in my first year and I want to (laughs) say we like go to San Diego. Does that sound right? We go into San Diego for training camp because Doc wanted to play golf at Torrey Pines. San Diego. That's where we were up. We stayed at Torrey Pines. And we, as soon as we got, we got there, uh, we go to the gym. And we're all getting shots up or whatever. This is like the day before the first practice. And I went over to you and I was like, hey, Ty, I was like, hey, who's who's starting at the two? <laughs> <laughs> and you looked at me and you were like, you, you motherfucker. motherfucker. <laughs> That's what you mean? Who, we done signed you all this money. You're talking about who's starting at the two. But like, you know, Doc, you know, he just thinks a lot of times people, you know, they understand, they know, but... I'm like you started too. What you mean? That was never communicated to me. Just so we're clear, I, I didn't. That's not why I signed. You. <laughs> that's not why I signed. You. Well worked out. <laughs> um, you, you mentioned this. So you, your last year was Orlando. You went basically right into coaching as, in a player development role in Boston. When did you know during your playing career that you wanted to get into coaching? I didn't know. Um, in 2003, when I played for Doc in Orlando, um, he basically just said, like, you know, T. Lou, when you're done playing, you can come coach with me. And I was like. No way. Like, I'm never going to, especially with all these guys, the way they act, I'm not going to never coach. He's like, I'm just telling you, Ty, you, you know, if you, if you want to do it. And so after we had that run, we went to the finals in Orlando. And, um, like, all I knew was basketball. So, I mean, like, what else I was going to do? So I called Doc, and Doc was like, okay, I'll call you back in two days. And usually that means, like, oh, yeah, whatever. But he called back in two days, and him and Danny Ainge, um, you know, found me a spot, you know, player development. And, um the first two years, he kind of let me get my feet wet to see if I wanted to do it, if I wanted to coach, um, get the player out of me. And um, after my first, like halfway through the first year, I started taking a liking to it. And um, Doc gave me a lot of responsibility of dealing with Rondo and KG and P. Pierce. And those are my three guys that I dealt with a lot. And so um, just be able to tell those guys the truth and, you know, not lie and not BS them. Um, he helped me mature and got me ready for to be a head coach. And when you can tell guys like KG and Rondo and P. Pierce the truth and they don't want to hear it, but you still tell the truth, um, it develops you in, in a pretty fast, you know, pretty fast way. What was the biggest adjustment in terms of you in the locker room, just going straight from being a player to having to deal with guys in a different level from like an accountability standpoint? Um, it was pretty easy, I think, because you know, when I played, I wasn't a great player, but I worked hard. You know, I played hard every single night. I gave it my all. I think, you know, never having a drink in my life, never having a smoke of anything and just, you know, holding guys accountable for being a good person. You know, that's always been me. And so going to the locker room, you know, KG knew who I was. P. Pierce, we was the same class, me, him and KG. So they knew who I was and, you know, what I brought to the table and what I meant. Um, as a person, you know, the hardest person was Rondo, you know, because, you know, it's hard for Rondo to trust if he doesn't know you. Like to get into Rondo and 
to be able to have that relationship with him, um, that was the toughest thing for me. But we became really close. Um, he listened to me for a lot of things, a lot of advice, and we just went forward from there. But just being, I guess, a peer around a locker room and being the same age as a lot of guys in the locker room, um, that could be a tough thing. So on, on that note, you, you know, you probably dealt with difficult locker rooms, maybe even difficult teammates as players. And I wasn't there in Boston, but there's been a lot of stories, a lot of documentation of rifts between certain factions of the team or whatever. Did going through that and being on that staff and sort of seeing that in real time, did that sort of prepare you at all or or influence at all how you felt about dealing with those sort of issues once you became a head coach? It did prepare me. I think, you know, Doc giving me a lot of leeway to to be myself, but also um, allowing me to to speak to those guys and tell those guys the truth and um, to put me with P. Uh, Pierce, KG, and Rondo, your first and second year in the league, that's a lot. That's a lot of trust. And Doc had a lot of trust in me. Um, so um, that helped me out, you know, tremendously. But also, I think going into the press conferences, when Doc did his press conferences after a tough loss or after we had a riff on the floor or in a, in a huddle and just seeing how he handled press conferences and how he talked to the media and how he adjusts the media every single day was big for me as well. Doc has said to me multiple times, and I, I did two Sixers games this year on ESPN, and he, when I would meet with the coaches beforehand, he yeah. would repeat <laughs> the same thing to me, but he's always said to me that I was going to coach, and it sounds like he, he said the same thing to you, and I you know, you make too much money to coach, but go ahead. That's, I mean, that's, that's yeah, you make. True. Yes, it is. Yes, it that's is. That's not true. You make too much money to coach. It's a, it's a tough grind. <laughs> I wouldn't do it if I don't have to. <laughs> oh man, uh, you're talking me out of it, T. Lou. You're talking me out of I'm it. Just saying, no, man. but I would always tell Doc. I'd be the same. I'd had the same reaction you did, which is yeah. basically like fuck off. Man. Yeah, I'm not coaching. I'm not no, coaching. It's a lot. It's um, a lot. But I, I'm just curious because I, I, you know, I played for Doc, I played for Stan, Rick Carlisle, Brett Brown, Alvin Gentry, obviously Coach K, and you know, there's there's different lessons um, you learn from each one. There's different things you take away from each coach. Uh, you know, Stan is a great example. Like I, I, I took away like personal accountability, right? You're you're, you're accountable to yourself, and that makes you accountable to your team. You know, that's that's there's a professionalism to that. Um, you know, with Brett, it was like attention to detail. Doc, for me, was like being able to speak and motivate and, and being around him so much, not just, you know, as a player, an assistant coach, and obviously, again, uh, with the Clippers. What were the sort of takeaways, lessons you learned from Doc? I think one was hard work. Um, he told me it wasn't going to be easy. And, I, you know, um, as a player, you never know, you know, how many hours a coach is actually putting in until you're actually in it. And, um you know, my first year coming to um, to the Clippers, um, the first four years I was behind the bench in Boston. So coming to the Clippers, that's my first time being on the bench and um, having the responsibility of doing the defense. And so um, the whole summer, Doc was like, I want you to take all the Western Conference teams that was in the playoffs and I want you to do uh, make a book, all every game they played in the playoffs, how they scored, you know, how a team, whatever. So I did this book all summer. So Chance and them was, you know, they came in town, they going to dinner, they – I couldn't do anything. I'm just doing this book, doing this book every single day of the summer. And so I turned it into Doc um, when we about to start training camp, gave it to Doc. He never opened it and still hasn't opened it. <laughs> and still hasn't opened it. But it was one of the hardest things I've ever done. And it taught me, like, to, it prepared me to get ready to do the defense because, you know, coming here with CP and Blake and two guys that are very smart, DJ and having to answer questions and, you know, be right on point, it did teach me a lot and taught me a lot of hard work. But I think with Doc, just teach me how to work hard is one thing. I think um, don't waste your bullets, you know, because, you know, players get tired of hearing the head coach talk all the time. So you got to pick and choose your spots when you want to really go off and, and you know, make a, make a point. And um, I think just ATOs, the way he did it, his poise, you know, on the bench, which he goes crazy at times, but just his poise in, in crunch time, you know, just – um, be able to draw up a play that you know is going to work. Now, whether you made the shot or not, uh, we know every single time Doc's going to draw a play up where you're going to get a great shot every single time. And so really learning that and how to be strategic and making adjustments and doing different things. What would you learn from Phil? I think from Phil, more so poise. Um, he did all of his coaching in practice, you know, in the game. He'll let you figure it out. And, you know, a lot of times we'd be, be down 20 and you see Phil on the side with his legs crossed, you know, fire on his nails like – you know, you get, we looking at like, we're going to call a timeout. Like, no, you guys figure it out, you know? And so he did a lot of his coaching, 
um, in practice. But, you know, another big thing I took away from Phil is he held Kobe and Shaq more, um, he, he held them more accountable than anybody else. And so when you have your two best players and you hold those guys accountable in front of everyone and they see how you stay on Kobe, you stay on Shaq, then everybody else just kind of falls in line. And I learned that from, um, from, um, Phil as well. Yeah. I was going to ask you about that. Your general sort of coaching philosophy about coaching players and, and the accountability piece, of course, but also sort of the empathy piece. Do you, think that you have to coach a star player differently than you do a role player or maybe a non-rotation player or do you coach everybody the same no it's definitely <laughs> you know anything you do in life it's always um a pecking order and so you know if you ran me in 50 million dollars for my company and you bring me in five thousand, i mean i'm pretty sure <laughs> you're gonna get away with more than he's gonna get away with but you still have to hold him accountable and i think you know you've been on you know a lot of great teams and you have two players. I seen Draymond Green make that uh, had that speech to, um, a couple of days ago um, about you have two players who can do whatever they want to do, and then the rest of the guys are gonna be role players and gotta fall in line. And so, with that being said, you want to you know let those guys be who they are, but also hold those guys accountable too, because you can't just do whatever you want to do. Because if that's the case, you'll lose a locker room with a lot of other players as well. So, um, you know they're gonna take some bad shots. You know it's gonna be times they don't get back on defense. You know, and but if Terrence Mann did it or you know, someone else did it, it'd be different. But um, I try to coach everyone the same as far as accountability factor, but as far as taking shots, who's going to have the ball in their hands, who's going to make the plays, um, that's a little different. It feels so good to have basketball back in full swing. You can already tell this is going to be an awesome season, so be sure to get in on the action with DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. New customers can make any $5 NBA Moneyline bet and get $200 in free bets if your team wins. And check this out. In addition to the usual bets, everyone can boost their winnings up to 100% with DraftKings stepped-up same-game parlays. Go to the DraftKings Sportsbook app, opt in, and place a stepped-up same-game parlay bet today. With payouts bigger than ever, DraftKings Sportsbook is where I go to bet on the NBA. There's a big matchup this week in Brooklyn. The Mavs are in town. I'm ready to see some Luka magic in Brooklyn. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now. Use promo code JJ. Make any $5 bet this week and get $200 in free bets if your team wins. Only at DraftKings Sportsbook with promo code JJ. Minimum age and eligibility restrictions apply. See show notes for details. With the NBA season starting, my schedule is getting pretty packed. With all the go, 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 it leaves me very little time to kick back and read a book. And that's why I love Audible. Audible offers an incredible selection of audiobooks across every genre, from bestsellers and new releases to memoirs, mysteries, and thrillers, motivation, wellness, business, and so much more. You'll discover exclusive Audible originals from top celebrities, renowned experts, and exciting new voices in audio. As an Audible member, you can choose one title a month to keep from their entire catalog, including the latest bestsellers and new releases. And all Audible members get access to a growing selection of audiobooks, Audible originals, and podcasts that are included with membership. You can listen to all you want and more get added every month. I personally love the Audible app. It's so convenient whether you're working out, on the road, on the driving range, whatever. I'm currently listening to David McCullough's The Pioneers. So let Audible help you discover new ways to laugh, be inspired, or be entertained. New members can try it free for 30 days. Visit audible.com slash old man or text old man to 500 500. That's audible.com slash old man or text old man to 500 500 to try Audible free for 30 days. Audible.com slash old man. In, in retrospect, you starting your career with Kobe and Shaq and then going to play with Michael, does it feel like a blessing just being able to see that right away? So it's like everything is, you know, everything sort of pales in comparison to playing with those I mean, guys. it definitely was a blessing, you know, um, coming from Mexico, Missouri, and um, not knowing where I was going to end up, you know, and having a chance, like you said, the first three years of my career playing with Kobe and Shaq, and then, you know, playing with Michael Jordan, you know, someone we all idolized growing up. Um, it was a dream and it was a blessing, you know, to me. And so winning two championships with the Lakers and then going to play with Jordan, like what else could you really ask for? You know, if my career would have stopped there, I mean, that's all I could probably possibly have a dream about. So, um, I mean, dream of. So, um, you know, Michael Jordan, you know, taught me a lot as far as just work ethic, you know, being 40 years old and you come to the gym, he's already got a sweat, he's already lathered, he done lifted, you know, got his one-on-zero one on individual workout. And, um, 
you know, Kobe, the work ethic, work ethic he had, and then Shaq as well. So just seeing those guys and how they prepared and, you know, what they was able to go through to get to where they're at, um, it was a great to see, especially at a young age. Do you do you, do you put a, a mint in your mouth? Is it a lozenge? A mint. It's a mint? Yeah. I've always wondered that. Yeah, because I used to chew gum. Yeah. But um, Brandy Garnett and uh, my grandma talked. <laughs> I said, you can't be on TV chewing that damn gum. And, you know, so I kind of took the gum out <laughs> and I went with the mint, you know, to try. <laughs> she said, I'll be smacking and chewing on the gum too much. You know when you have, like, images of a player? And it's like, it's like... <laughs> It's like I think of Kawhi, and like unfortunately, I think of him shooting a fallaway jumper on the right baseline that bounces eight <laughs> times and goes in the game. But you have certain images of players, right, right? right? And then when I think of certain coaches, you know, Doc. Of course, if you played for a guy, you hear his voice. You yeah. don't see him, but you hear your voice. When I think of you, I think of this really chill motherfucker with a <laughs> mint in his mouth just sitting there. But it is interesting to hear that 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 Phil did have that influence on you. Because you you do seem poised, you seem relaxed, and I think that is sort of reflected in your team. I mean, a great example of that is the is the way you guys are able to come back from deficits, and you did that a number of times last year. Yeah, I think um, just being poised. I think your team they see that they can feel it. Um, if you're all you know rattled, especially at the end of games, and you know, you're going crazy, then, you know, guys feel that. And so you can never really get your point across because you're mad, the players are mad. And so I always just try to stay poised, stay even keeled. And um, that that reflects on our team, you know, on whatever team you have. And so I just try to try to stay that way. I think, I think uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong here, but I, I think to being a former player, when I think about potentially coaching someday as well, I think about body language. And how much body language matters, the way you walk into a room, the way you walk into the locker room, the way you react to things on the court. And I, I think a coach's body language is equally, if not more important to a player's body language. Way more important. If that makes sense. You think it's more important? Well? Way more important because... You know, after every missed shot, after every turnover, if a guy putting his head down or, or screaming, you miss an assignment defensively, and they're going crazy, like, you know, the players feel that. And then you got to think about the players who are on the bench. So they're thinking like, damn, when I'm in the game, is he doing the same thing when I'm in the game? You know, so um, it is a trick. You pro- you've, you've probably played for coaches that talk I've shit about it. players I've on the court. It. And then <laughs> you're sitting on the bench yeah. and you're like, Man, what does he say about exactly. me? <laughs> exactly. So, you know, you try to stay away from that. But that's just kind of like my nature. Um, you know, just being poised and just trying to stay in the moment. Don't get too high. Don't get too low. And so that's why I apologize for never seeing, you know, one of the best podcasts, I guess, that's going on right now because I just kind of stay away from everything and just kind of stay even cute. Have, have you had a, I mean, I could think of a couple of examples as a fan, not to put words in your mouth, but have you had a moment when you're coaching or playing, but really when you've been coaching where it's been so exciting that you actually feel like you've lost your composure? Um, actually, you know, I, I get emotional at times, you know. Um, so I think after that game, when we came back and beat Utah, they were down 25 at halftime and I'm um, getting the Clippers to the Western Conference Finals. Um, you know, going to the locker room by myself, I went to like the, the side coach's locker room and, you know, I, I started crying a little bit and Chauncey came in the locker room and just... You know, with Kawhi being hurt in game four and, um, you know, backs being against the wall in two series prior to that. And just, you know, it was just tough. And just seeing that we, you know, was able to um, get over that hurdle, you know, even with Kawhi going down and team to accomplish what we accomplished. Um, it was a very, you know, very um, emotional moment. And so um, that was probably one of my moments. And then, of course, like you said, you know, winning the championship in Cleveland. Um, my mom, my grandmother was battling cancer at the time, so they couldn't come to the games. And uh, we won a championship and just, you know, all the stuff I've been through that year, um, I had to hold in and not tell people about. And um, and going through that, I think that was a lot. And then when you finally, you know, win and it's over, you can finally exhale. And that's kind of like what it feels like. I'm glad you admit that you're a crier. I'm also I'm At a, times. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a crier too. I'm a crier too. <laughs> I'm a crier too. Yeah. So you're just gonna cry right now. <laughs> no, 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 just no. listen to tell you the story. Oh my god. <laughs> no, I mean when things mean something to you, yeah. you know, that they're important, um, you know, you're gonna cry. Um, and so, you know, like winning the championship for me is you know, a first time coach and you know, getting moved over to a seat that, you know, you think you can do it, but you've never done it and do it halfway through the season and you know, try to win a championship, you know, with LeBron James because everybody's, you know, focused on him, whether he's 50 years old or 25, you know, 
But if you got LeBron, you're supposed to win. And so just going through all that all year long and, like I said, battling the things with my grandmother, my mom, um, there's a lot of emotions, you know. So when you care about something strongly, you know, you have emotions. Going back to the, the Clippers and getting to the conference finals, something that they had never done before, you having been here as assistant coach uh, twice and then becoming the head coach and getting them that far, like how much did that mean, not just to you? Were you like aware of for everybody here, Dennis over here, it's <laughs> been here like nine years right. or whatever it is, like the importance of that moment for this organization? Yeah, I did. I realized it for our fans, um, for the fan base for one, and Mr. Bomber and the great job he did with building his team and, um, you know, with Lawrence Frank and, you know, Mark Hughes, oh, shout out Winger, to Frank. We got, yeah. we got. <laughs> you know, Winger, Trent Red, and, you know, job they've done just of, you know, constructing this team and, you know, coaching staff and just seeing all the hard work that's went into it all over, the, you know, over all these years. And like I said, me being part of two of them and then like, you know, finally getting a chance to do it myself. Um, it was a big step for, you know, the Clippers organization and our fan base. Going back to uh, 2014 summer. Um, I thought you were coming back here to be an assistant coach and you went to Cleveland to be an assistant coach. Was that a difficult decision to leave Doc, go to Cleveland? Yeah, I know was, some of that obviously probably had to do with Braun, but like how difficult was that decision? I mean, it was tough, you know, because I'm a loyal person. And so um, I've always felt like Doc gave me my first opportunity to coach. And so, you know, I can't leave. And, um, you know, I was here on the front of the bench doing a defense and we had a great team and um top five defense too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, top five defense, you know, and you know, just having, you know, like you and Blake and DJ and CP, you know, just having a great team and having Doc. Um, I thought my opportunity to be a head coach would come because I was you know, a side a side doc. And um when I went to Cleveland to interview for the head coaching job, um, me and Coach Black, you know, we ended up being the two finalists. And so um, he went back and did another interview. I did another interview. And, um, that morning, um, before they offered me the assistant job, I thought the job was mine. Um, they had called me and told me like, you know, like, this is your job. We're going to do the press conference. We'll call you back later. So I took a nap. <laughs> I woke up and on ESPN and said, you know, David Griffin's been named. I mean, David Blatt has been named the head coach of the Cleveland Cavaliers. Like, oh, sh like whatever. I didn't, I was like, okay, whatever. So, um, about three hours later, you know, David Griffin called my agent and was like, hey, we want to bring Ty Lu in as associate head coach. I was like, no, nah, I can't do that. Like, I can't leave Doc. And so the money kept going up and up <laughs> and up. And so I was like, man, I can't do it. And so I called Doc. I was like, listen, um, they offered me a crazy amount of money to be associate head coach, but I don't want to leave. You know, what do you think? And so um, Doc was like, listen, you know, you ready to spread your wings. I think, you know, it's time for you to get out underneath my umbrella. You know, I think being associate head coach in Cleveland and um, having a chance to continue to work your way up, I think it'd be good for you. And so it was a tough decision for me, you know, personally, because like I said, Doc taught me everything I knew and to leave him and um, to lead the team we had, like I said, fifth in defense that year and um, continue to get better. I just thought it was a tough because at that point, LeBron hadn't, he hadn't said he was going back yet. So, you know, but they did have Kyrie and um, I think Deion Waiters was there at the time. And so they had some young talent. So I was like, okay, um, it could be okay. But I still wasn't positive about it. But Doc, you know, he blessed me and told me I should try to, you know, take a chance. And if it doesn't work out, you can always come back. So um, that was good to hear. When you when you got the head coaching job there, obviously it happened in January. So it's the middle of the season. Is there, was there a part of you that it's like this, there's so much going on that you almost, you know, couldn't focus on what, like, how do you, how do you deal with something like that where you're thrown into the mix right in the middle of the season rather than being like, okay, this is starting. You have a summer to prepare for it. You know, everything like that. I was scared. You know, I was scared of the opportunity. And um, when they first told me, when David Griffin told me, I told him no. And then I called uh, Doc first and then I called, you know, Jerry West and they both were like, you have to take it. And Doc said, if you don't, somebody's going to take it. But I was like, I was scared because, you know, I think um, just all the scrutiny, you know, that follows, you know, LeBron's teams and coming in halfway through the season where Coach Blatt did a great job the year before. We went to the finals. And then the year I took over, we was number one in the East <laughs> when they fired him, you know. And so um, just a lot of pressure in that regard. And so um, I was scared. You know, I thought I was ready to be a head coach. But until you actually slide over a chair and actually experience it, you never know. And so... 
I'm after talking to Doc and, you know, talking to Jerry. I told Griff, I, I said, um, let me think about it for a little while and I'll, you know, I'll get back to you. And so, you know, I made the decision, um, went to LeBron, you know, Caleb and Kyrie, you know, right away and just kind of told them my vision, you know, what I thought, um, what we need to do, how I should look. And they all had my back, you know, 100 percent. And they made my job easy, you know, because if it wasn't for the stars being on board, it could have been tough, you know. And so um, they kind of followed my lead. They allowed me to do what I needed to do to kind of change some things. And, um, you know, it was all she wrote. But it was it was it was a tough it was a tough process. Outside of just the the general sort of scrutiny and attention and fanfare and media attention and all that stuff that comes with coaching LeBron or, or being part of LeBron's team, was there anything that sort of surprised you that you could not have prepared for? All the other shit you have to do as a head coach that you just were completely unaware of. One of those like you don't know until you know type things. The most I hate the media. Uh, I mean, that was the, that was the biggest thing for me. And um, Ty, we're, we're part of the media. <laughs> <laughs> no, not hate y'all personally, just hated doing it. You know, I just um, it wasn't my thing just to be in front of the cameras and, you know, talking. And so I hated doing that after every game. And then when you get to the playoffs, I mean, it's seven times a day. You got shoot around media. You got the, the guys that come in. John Barry and them come in before that. You got um, pregame. You got uh in the third quarter or first quarter, depending on if you're home or away, you got the post game. You got, I mean, it's just so much stuff you got to do and be able to handle. And so with LeBron's teams, you know, they always looking for one little thing to try to make a story out of it. So you got to be very careful. And, um, and so it just took a lot of practice with that, you know, just working on that. But like I said, you know, Bron has been everything to my career, just as far as, you know, winning the championship and, um, you know, how he stamped me as, you know, being a, being a good coach and, um, things I've learned from him, just having to be prepared every single day. Like he doesn't miss anything, offense, defense, terminology. Um, he's right on top of it every single time. So you have to stay on your toes. You got to be prepared. And, um, he always kept me one step ahead. So, um, you know, shout out to Brian for, you know, getting me to where I'm at today. What was going through your head, uh, on his block on Iggy? When it was, when did it happen? On oh, Iguodala? Yeah. <laughs> it was a stretch. Like neither team scored for like four minutes and we're going back and forth, back and forth. Caleb got a big stop on Steph. LeBron got the block. You know, we called timeout, and um, you know, Brian was exhausted. And um, you know, Kyrie, um, being the guy that he is, I knew he wanted it. You know, Brian wanted it too, but Brian was fatigued. He was, you know, he had forty points, doing everything, blocking shots, guarding one through five, scoring, assisting, and so you know, went to the timeout, and I was like, "Listen, Kyrie, where you want the ball?" And he was like. If I can get on the right wing, right wing. So we ran a pick and roll with um, Jr. because he has uh, Steph guarding him to get the switch, and then we ran a twist action to get Kyrie going back to his right hand, and he had him on the right wing, and I um, mean danced and made a step. Back. I didn't know he was gonna take a three. <laughs> I thought he'd go to the rack or get to his pull up his mid range, but he took a step back three and like the ball's in the air for three minutes. <laughs> I'm like, oh, sh-. like what's gonna happen? And he made it, and like. You know, that's who Kyrie is. Like he wants to, he loves the big moment. He loves the big shots. And, um, that's, that's one of the biggest shots in NBA history. You know, um, game seven on the road to make a shot like that. It was, it was huge. I agree with you. I, I, it really is one of the biggest shots in NBA history. Also because of the circumstances, you guys coming back from three one. It is interesting though that that shot probably doesn't get talked about as much as LeBron's block, which is. I don't know why. Maybe it's like <laughs> it's like the game winning shot, you know? It's yeah. Like, yeah, I mean, because if you think about it, if Bron didn't block the shot, Eagle Doll scores, they're up two, and you run the play, and Kyrie shoots a three, we're still up one, and we win the game. <laughs> and, we, and we win the game, if you think about that. But the block was just, I mean, JR did a good job of running through, not fouling. Bron, perfect timing, not go 10 in the basketball. But I mean, it was a huge play. Like, that was one of the huge, you know, biggest blocks in the NBA history in the finals as well. I mean, Tayshaun had one in the Eastern Conference finals against Reggie Miller, but, you know, the shot, the Braun block, you know, game seven, you know, minute and a half left in the game, like, couldn't get any bigger than that. Giannis's block two years ago. On Aiden. On Aiden, yeah. on the alley-oop with yeah. Book, when Book threw it without that one-legged, or the, the, the one-handed pass was yeah. also probably one of the best blocks I can remember. How confident, I mean, Kevin Love's our guy, Yeah. how confident were you? On that last possession, when, when he, he had got, Steph. <laughs> <when> he had <laughs> Steph. <laughs> hey, K Love, listen, in big moments like Shaq said, I make free throws when it counts. When it counts, 
I trust Caleb to get a stop. And like I said, he was moving those feet, um, staying in front, you know, made Steph take a tough step back three. And, um, you know, Kevin was huge. That was a big play. And in that game seven, I think he had like six, seven offensive rebounds. And um, offensively, you know, we didn't really go to him as much as we probably should have because Kyrie and LeBron really had a hell of a series, you know. But um, Caleb was huge for us, you know, all season long and the whole time I was there, actually. Let's be real. Fall is chaos in your pants. You're overheating one second and freezing the next. To be ready for anything, you need underwear that can handle everything. It's time for Tommy John underwear. In Tommy John underwear, you're that much more comfortable, so you can do everything better. Name a problem with other underwear and Tommy John solved it. Tommy John's breathable lightweight fabric is four times the stretch of competing brands. They come with a no wedgie guarantee, thanks to a non-rolling waistband and legs that never ride up. Plus, they feature a horizontal quick draw fly. Hammock pouch support stops to awkward swing and slap, giving everyone something to be grateful for. With over 17 million pairs sold, people love Tommy John underwear. That's why Tommy John doesn't have customers, they have fanatics. Honestly, I'm a big fan of the horizontal quick draw fly, and I love wearing Tommy John, whether it's golf, on set, whatever. I feel completely comfortable. I can't recommend Tommy John enough. Plus, everything's back with Tommy John's best pair you'll ever wear or it's free guarantee. Go to TommyJohn.com slash JJ right now for 20% off your first order. 20% off at TommyJohn.com slash JJ. TommyJohn.com slash JJ. See site for details. There, there's, a, there's a pretty legendary story that's been well documented, but I hope you will be able to share it as well on the show um, after game five. When you guys won at Oracle, oh. I, I want to hear your sort of version of that story. I, I'm also curious, though, after game four, when you guys lose at home, and at the time you probably didn't know whether or not Draymond would be suspended and you basically get blown out at home in game four, you're down 3-1. What did you uh, What did you tell the team then? I said, whoever don't believe we can win, don't get on the plane um, tomorrow. And um, that, I really believe that. You know, they the first two games, I thought they blew us out you know, on their floor because we weren't ready for their speed and the pace of how they play. You know, you can prepare for it all you want, but until you actually get a chance to get on the floor and see how fast they play, how hard they cut, you know, um, you really don't know. And so um, game after game two, we came home, made some adjustments that I thought was great for us. Um, game four, you know, we lost. It was a close game, but um, our adjustments were exactly what we needed to do. And so we just had to do them better. We had a couple of mess ups. And then game five, I think, you know, before we got on that plane to go there, I said, listen, if you don't believe we could win, you know, stay at home. And I thought we actually really could win. I didn't think it was over. And, um, you know, Draymond got suspended game five. Um, we came out, Kyrie and Braun both have 40, um, going home for game six, you know, so after game five, actually, um, we were going home for game six. So we won, we won game five. We're in the locker room. And I had everybody in the locker room give me $200. So all the players, um, Mr. Gilbert, you know, Griff, everybody, everybody give me $200. And they said, like, what you doing with this money? I, so I wrapped it up and actually got the video on my phone. And um, I put it in the cell and said, uh, we're coming back for game seven and get our money. And so we go home. Uh, we win big in game six. Um, Steph gets ejected. Um, you know, it was kind of getting, you know, um, and so we won game six. And so we go home for, I mean, we go to uh, Golden State for game seven. We win a championship. Everybody's going crazy. And so I go in the ceiling and get the money. And so first thing Brian asked me, like, hey man, where's that money? I said, man, I don't know. It, it disappeared, but I kept, I kept it, I kept it for myself. So, uh, but just think about that. We win a championship and Brian asked, where's the money at that's hidden in the ceiling? Doesn't miss anything. Doesn't miss anything, <laughs> but I kept it. So now you know, Brian. <laughs> um, there was a, there was an article during this past season uh, on ESPN.com about you. And I know you hate the media, but um, in the article, uh, Reggie Jackson said about you that you were the third star of the Clippers. And I asked people around the league, whether it's players, former players, uh, people in the media, here we talk, like, who's your top five? Who's your uh, who, who's the best defensive player? Like, stuff like that. When we talk about the best coaches in the league, I, I think, I, at least in my experience like everybody mentions your name as one of the two or three best coaches do you do you think of yourself as a star coach do you think of yourself as the best or one of the best I wouldn't say a star coach um I think I learned a lot you know along the way um it's an honor to be you know finally in that light you know um 
And, you know, when you coach LeBron, it's hard to get a lot of credit because he's so great and all the things he does, you know, you kind of, um, you know, the coaches kind of get, you know, set to the side like Spo. You know, when Bron left, that he's considered Spo, you know, one of the top coaches in the league. And um, I think when I was able to, you know, leave Bron and leave Bron's umbrella and come into the Clippers, I think that's when I started getting, you know, more credit, you know, what I can do. And um, being a good coach, I wouldn't say I'm a top coach or the best coach or nothing like that because a lot of great coaches out there. But um, I do believe, you know, uh, coaches are great in – in certain areas, you know, like, you know, me, like in adjustments and, you know, doing different things. I think we had to relate to the players. I think um, we had to keep my poise in pressure situations. So the team, they can, they can feel, um, they can feel poised and confident as well. Um, but it's an honor to, you know, to finally, you know, be uh, recognized as, you know, as a really good coach. And so, like I said, thank you for the for the um, comment. I didn't. I didn't say. You I, did say I didn't it. say. You did say it. No, I didn't say. I thought that. <laughs> I said other message. people said that. <laughs> but no, I mean that's a, that's a huge. No, I'm kidding. That's, that's a huge I actually, I, I, I mean, I think I've said this publicly. If not, I'll say it. But I, you know, I consider you and Spo to be the two best coaches in the NBA right now. I don't. I don't think that's uh, that much of a hot take. I just no, that's I, what I believe. No, thank really you. But I mean, you, you know, you got Pop, and you know, for everything he's he's done, and you know, Steve Kerr, you know, the job he did this year was unbelievable you know i think steph being out down the stretch and having to come back just for the playoffs and keeping that team ready and um having young players step up and and play meaningful minutes and and you know um clay coming back being off two and a half years and for the jobs you know steve Kerr did this year that was that was a uh, phenomenal that was huge and so like just me and mentioned like you said in the conversation with these guys who are really great coaches to me. Um, like I said, I said, thank you. And like I said, it's, it's an honor. It really is to come a long way um, and to be in this position I'm in. Well, it, it, look, I, this, I wasn't trying to disrespect Steve. Um, who no, no, no. You can't. How can you? Yeah, no, yeah. No, yeah. Saying, I, but I, to your point, like me not even mentioning him, like it's well, it, part of it is like to your point about Braun, it's like he's, yeah, he's, he's the win. Well, yeah. He's got Steph. Yeah. No, <laughs> now he got Steph, but he's been winning. He don't won yeah, four. Yeah. Like he's, he, he's, he's won, won as a player. player. Yeah, yeah. Like, so, I mean, it's kind of like one of those things when you grandfather in, like, Who's the best player? They go, oh, Shaq. Well, Shaq don't count. Well, why not? You know? <laughs> you know, so like Steve Kerr, you know, he's that. Him and Pop is like, you know, that's what they are. You know, they're they're at the top of the bar and, you know, that's what we're all trying to get to. And like she said, Spo, you know, as well. So just to be mentioned in the conversation with those guys, you know, it means a lot. And I still have a lot of work to do and I'm going to do the work to get there. But um, but I appreciate it. Well, to, th to this point, we were talking about the Utah series earlier, you know, no Kawhi all the role players that stepped up guys like Terrence Mann, stuff like that, who were not necessarily even playing very much earlier in the playoffs. And they will, you guys, you know, to that series win. What's the secret to sort of extracting success from guys like that, who have barely, you know, either played a little bit, barely played at all. And over the last like month or so. I think there's a few factors. I think one is just the communication with the players. I think, you know, letting those guys know that, you know, time's going to come, um, being direct with them let them know they're not going to play. And, you know, we need you to do this for this amount of time. And um, Kenny Atkinson, um, who came in, who did player development, did a great job. You know, he did some things that I've never seen as a head coach, uh, which was they call them the stay ready games. And every day, you know, Terrence Mann, Amir Coffey, Patrick Patterson, those guys are playing five on five against our coaching staff and, you know, some of the other players that wasn't playing. And so they constantly stayed ready. And so when you call their name, they was ready to play because they were playing – you know, five on five games every single day after practice to stay ready. And so I've never seen that before until Kenny, you know, brought that. But, um, when you, I think when you communicate with the guys, you know, when the guys, you know, put the work in, like Kenny had the guys putting the work in and you just show confidence in the player. I think, you know, I want every player to be who they are. And, um, if I got to make adjustments to make sure it fits within our team, then I can do that. But don't come in trying to fit in. Like, do what you do, and I'll be able to adjust and to make you fit in with the team. And so that's kind of how I treat my players, and they understand that. And so I try to give them confidence going forward. You had to uh, certainly manage uh, expectations, championship expectations, when you coached the Cavs with Braun and um, maybe not this past season because of Kawhi's injury, but certainly in your first year with the Clippers. How do you, specifically to the NBA in terms of coaching, like how do you manage those championship expectations, those championship goals during an 82-game 82 reg, 82 regular season? You know, um, I think in Cleveland it got hard because, you know, we went to the final four straight years. And so um, 
to the regular season get dull? Is that yeah, yeah, it did. I mean, not for me, but like for the players, they oh we they, we don't respect this team or what you mean they won sixty one games? We don't respect that team or we don't you know so like it got to a point where they were just so confident that we we're gonna go to the finals like the regular season didn't really mean much and and so it's kind of hard. Because like I said, every year we turned it on and we went to the finals. So like to convince guys, like we still got to put the work in. We still got to do the right things to get there. Um, it became tough. But, you know, with leadership of Braun, um, he made it a lot easier for sure. Because every single day he's going to come in and get his work in. He's going to do the right thing. There's no messing around once he gets in between the lines. And it helped us, you know, it helped us through those, you know, through the long seasons of just waiting to get to the playoffs, waiting to get to the playoffs. Um, I think here with the Clippers, it's been different because, we haven't had any championship success. We haven't been to the finals. And so, you know, each year, I think um, the first year I took over, just you know, the preparation with Kawhi and PG and Marcus Morris and just, you know, the leadership they had, just trying to, you know, to do something special. And we had a chance before Kawhi got hurt. And then, you know, last year, you know, the same thing of just, you know, before PG got hurt and was out of all those games, just the mentality we had, like, okay, Kawhi's out. We don't know how long he's out for, but – we still want to make the most of it. We can still be a good team. And um, so just putting that work in to try to get to that level of, you know, getting to the finals, winning the championship. And so that's always going to be our, that's always going to be our goal. And so we can't stop short. So we can't not work. And that's, you know, the thing about this season is that, you know, they, Oh, you got a great team. You guys can win a championship, but no, we got to put the work in. Like you just don't come in and say Kawhi's back, PG's back. We're going to win a championship. Like, we added John Wall and it's going to work. Like, no, we got to put the work in. We got to be serious about what we're doing. And and then if we stay healthy and we do all the right things it takes to get there without taking shortcuts, then we have a great chance. But if we want to take shortcuts and we want to rely on Kawhi being back, PG being back, adding John Wall and not sacrificing because you know, we got a lot of players, 11 players that really deserve to play. You can't play 11 guys. So there's going to be a lot of sacrifice. There's going to be a lot of everything. And so... Um, we have a team to do it. You know, I, it's kind of been my model when I came in and you saw the first first year of the playoffs with Pat Beverly and Zoo, you know, two starters. And, you know, we got to, to the Dallas series and, you know, we didn't play them the last, you know, three or four games. And what they do, they cheer their teammates on. They were engaged in every huddle in practice and shoot arounds. They were great. The next series, Pat Beverly and Zoo were huge for us. You know, Pat doing a great job on Donovan Mitchell. Then he went to the next series, did a great job on Devin Booker. And so, you know, I think what comes with winning is sacrifice. If you don't have a team that's willing to sacrifice, it's hard to win. Was there anything with Kawhi um, that you just were surprised by or learned about of him on the court that you didn't know until you were with him every day? Um, defensively, I mean, I knew he was, you know, you see him two times a year. You you know, you heard about he's great and you see, you know, he's being great on TV, you know, four or five, six times a year. But when you actually see him, on a day-to-day basis and see how he can guard one through five and how he affects the game defensively. Like, I mean, it's mind-blowing. Just see some of the things that he does. And, um, like, we'd be watching film as, as a coaching staff and just like, Man, you see that play? Like, just making crazy plays. We just <laughs> grab the ball with one hand out of somebody's hand. And um, that was, like, you know, a huge thing. I knew we could score the basketball. I knew we can get to a spot from mid-range. But just defensively, just seeing how great he is uh, was, it was, was something special. The series that you mentioned against us, I was very, I didn't play, but <laughs> I was hurt. I was very briefly in Dallas, but that series was a wild series because the visiting team won every game. First time until, in NBA history. Until, yeah. Yeah. Uh, until, until game seven. Right. And uh, I, I go back, I think it was game six in Dallas, Kawhi's performance. Oh man. He had 44 and was just surgical from the mid range. And, Unfortunately, I've been on the yeah, again, like I mentioned before, I've been on the the wrong side of a bunch of <laughs> epic Kawhi performances. But I really mean this that that game to me was one of a handful of the best performances I've witnessed in person. Yeah, I mean, just doing it on both sides because in Game Six is when we actually just said, "Listen, you got Luca. Like whoever comes up, show and get out of the way, Kawhi. You got him. With no switching, we're not giving him that switch. We want to, you know, make sure you're the primary defender at all times." And he took that challenge in game six and seven. And like you said, had 44 points. But that whole series, I think, shooting 60% from the field. Um, it was, I mean, it was crazy, you know, the things he did in that series. And so, um, that's the player that he is. And so, you know, when the bar gets higher, you know, the better he gets. And so when playoff hits, that's when he's, he takes it to another level. You, you won a championship, uh, two, right? 
as a player, three. Two as a player. Two yeah. as a player. Yeah. You wanted as a player playing with Kobe and Shaq. Um, you know, you know Kawhi is is one two as well. And it, you know, if you look historically, uh, you won one with Braun as well. If you look historically, you need basically a top five or so player to win. And you've been in a position not last year because Kawhi and, and of course PG were hurt was hurt as well. Uh, but you've been in a position to coach these top five players. Like, could you, and, and you lived it as a player, could you sort of describe the impact and the difference, the, the specialness and uniqueness of the best versus even other all-stars? Like, what makes these guys so much better than everyone else? Well, I mean, you have a lot of guys that are, you know, that are really good players, but then you had those special guys, like you said, great players that, you know, some players can get you there, but then there's a handful of guys that can take you all the way over the top. And so, like, when you talk about, you know, top five, you're definitely talking about Kawhi, a guy that, okay, we get to the fourth quarter, last six minutes, we know he can take us there. And that's the difference, I think. You know, you get to situations where, you know, of course, I can make a game winner, you know, once every whatever, but I'm saying for a guy to just consistently do it, every single night and you trust that, okay, if we get to the last two minutes of the game, he's going to break us home. And there's not a lot of, you know, a lot of players like that. So that's when you get to your top five, top 10 players that on a night to night basis in the playoffs, you know, regular season that when we get to those last two minutes, they can bring us home. I was going to ask you about Kobe in particular. A lot of the guys come on the show, you know, obviously had a relationship with him and idolized him. Um, Was there anything you learned or just saw with him when you were with him for those years uh, that you pass on to especially younger players in terms of just preparation? Just the way he worked. I think, you know, people don't understand, it, you know, how hard to work or how hard it is to work until you actually do it and go through it. And just seeing Kobe and the work he put in every single day, um, you know, he was 19, 20 years old when I was on the team, you know, and just having a routine and having – to coming in at seven o'clock in the morning before everybody got there, get his lift in, get his workout in, and then come in and be full speed in practice. Like a lot of guys think, oh, well, I can't practice because I got to play. Like, no, like Michael Jordan at 40 practiced every single day. Doug Collins had to, you know, try to kick him off the floor. He wouldn't leave. And the same thing with Kobe. Like, okay, you put the work in individually, but also coming to practice and then playing 40 minutes in every game. Like, that's a lot. And I'm asking, and that's what the grades do. And so, just seeing how they work and how I played every preseason game. Michael Jordan, when he first came, they played every preseason game, like Kobe, every preseason game to get ready for the 82 game season. And so you see like the work those guys put in every single day. I'm like, man, I ain't working hard enough. I thought I was working hard, but these guys are, you know, 10 times, you know, more. And so that's what you see when you get to the Kobe's and the Jordans and, you know, LeBron's, like the work ethic, you know, Kawhi's. And so it's just, it's just a different work ethic than, you know, a lot of other people. If you look at last year's playoffs, for example, um, Western Conference, uh, you know, you've got Steve, you've got Jay Kidd, um, Monty in the previous round, Ime Udoka in the finals, um, you. Uh, like, what advantage do you think former players have as NBA coaches? I think um, because you know the locker room is one, because you've been in a locker room, you know when guys are tired. Um, you know, when guys need a day off, you know, so that I think having a pulse of the locker room as well, just knowing that, you know, when guys are on the, on the, on the brink of being pissed off or ready to give up, when you lose five games in a row, you go through a tough time and different things you have to do to try to you know, get their spirits up, you know, get the morale of the team up. If you've been through it, I think going through training camp and seeing how guys are tired and, you know, giving everything they have <laughs> ready to die. Okay. We need to back it off. We need to ease up. Let's take the day off, whatever, you know, so you've been through it. You've been in the trenches. And so I think, you know, guys can relate to you because you played, you've been in a locker room and it doesn't make it fair one way or another. Like if he's the head coach, he's the head coach. So you should listen. But I think, you know, as a head coach that played and you've been there, you've been through the wars, you've been, you know, in the finals, you've been in close games, you've made game winners, you know, you've been exhausted where you couldn't get out your bed the next day and you've been through that. So when you talk to a player and you try to show them and, you know, we have hard practices, they can be like, okay, well, he's been through it. You know, we came into the league, it was 30 days of training camp. It wasn't just, you know, three tour days and now y'all can just coast. Like, no, we had, with Stan, you know, we had 30 tour days. 
like on game days, we actually practice on, on preseason games. Like we actually practice because, you know, preseason didn't mean nothing. Like we actually practice on those days as well. So um, just having a feel, you know, for the players and be able to relate to them, I think is a huge advantage for a guy who's played the game. My rookie year, I think we had three days off the entire that's season. What, <laughs> the whole season. The, the whole season. <laughs> the whole season. That's what I'm saying. Like, and, and it was like, there was no like coming in and like, all right, we're going to walk through some right. stuff, watch some film and get your shots up. No, it's like, we're going to practice. Right. And, and shoot around. And look, that's not a knock on Brian Hill. Like that, that was the culture. Right. That's, that's what totally it was. It was a different thing. Yeah. And totally so like different. now with the low management stuff, like we got to be, you know, it's, it's a serious thing. Like we got to no, be, it is. it is. And so. Um, we just, that's just something we didn't know. And it's something that I had to learn, you know, along with B. Shaw and Larry Drew, older guys that played in the league. Like it's something we got to learn, like, because it is important. Um, it is important to try to get our guys to the finish line, you know, healthy and ready to play and ready to go. And so we have a, you know, a great, you know, a great, um, team that, you know, does all that with, you know, Ty Wright and, you know, John Meyer, you know, Maggie Bryant, Jason Powell, they do a great job of just, making sure our guys are ready to play. And so I trust them a hundred percent. And, you know, a lot of times when they say we need to have an off day, I don't believe it. And when, you know, we just got blown out, or, you know, but it is what it is. And so that's kind of the way the game is um, changed. And so you got to be able to adapt. And that's, you know, that's what I try to do. Shout out to Todd Wright, by the way. Yeah. You had him in Philly. The game. Yeah. He's my favorite guy in the world, yeah, man. He's great. He's great. Um, before I let you go, uh, and we appreciate the time on this, um, I can't let you go without asking because I'm sure you get asked a lot, but the, the AI shot. <laughs> Man, listen, nah, you know, you know, it's crazy because I'll say, first of all, like just growing up and he, he's only like two years older than me, but I still idolized him. Like, you know, just coming into the league, he was already in the league two or three years before me. And, um, just like, you know, it was Jordan. Then it was, you know, AI. Like that's who I looked up to, you know, six foot braids fast, you know, so, um, I don't think I ever said that, but I, I did. I, I looked up to him, you know, so having the opportunity and chance to to play against him in the finals, you know, and he did that, you know, that made the move and the step over. But it wasn't really a big deal. Like people go crazy. Like he's crossed me over. I fell down and then he shot and he stepped like, I mean, he snatched it back. I contested it. I fell and he stepped over. You me. fell on the contest. Yeah, I fell on the contest. I yeah, stepped I, on his foot. Like I, I rolled my ankle a little bit, fell down. He made a shot and stepped over me like, oh, I should step over I'm like, okay, well, I mean, it's AI, and so I don't mind. <laughs> that's, that's my guy, but, like, it's not like he crossed me over. I fell, then rolled over, and he shot and stepped over me. I mean, but no it is what it is. But I think Doug Collins put a lot on it, too, though. Oh, he stepped over <laughs> you. Yeah. And then I added extra to it, and then it just became more and more. But, you know, it is what it is. You know, when you play hard, you're going to get dunked on. You're going to get crossed over. You're going to get a lot of things. So, you know, it's, it's, it's not a – and then guess what? I always be in NBA history. They don't show it all the time. So I'm always going to be relevant no matter what happens. Also, you got a ring. You got a ring. Yeah. So it's like yeah. all's well that ends well. Right. <laughs> I mean, you you haven't you haven't done your NBA career right if unless you're turned into a meme or a gif. Right. That's what I yeah, think. Yeah, I think I mean, you haven't done it right. <laughs> <laughs> you got to do something. You know what I mean? And so I mean, I've forever go down in NBA history. So I mean, he actually, right. I, I I don't remember which platform he did it on, but I know he gave an interview in the last year where they asked him about that play. Oh, with Steven he, Jackson. Yeah, yeah it was Stack Jack and Matt Barnes. Was, yeah. yeah, all the smoke. And and he said, like, basically, I feel bad, you know, because you actually guarded him really well that yeah. series and you made it tough on him. No, and he's my guy, you know. So, like, then we weren't guys. Like, we, you know, we didn't get along then. But, like, you know, down the road, you know, like, we just had respect for each other just knowing that I'm a – I mean, yeah, you're a Hall of Famer. you one of the best players, like probably the best player six foot and under ever in the history of the game. And a lot of people feared you, you know? And so just, I think he respected me for just playing hard against, of course I'm not AI, or of course I don't compare it to him or his career, but just giving him my all every single night that I played against him and just playing hard, competing. And I think he respected that. Yeah. Uh, Tyler, this has been awesome, man. We yes, appreciate sir. the time. This is great. Thanks, Thank you man. for uh, letting us, uh, you know, interview you and, and actually participating in the media this is a big thing for you. <laughs> no Thank problem you. no problem you gotta clap again or it's, it's over, clap's yeah, over. the clap's over <laughs>